Okay, so uh, welcome everyone to our latest WAMDA webinar. Uh, we're broadcasting from Beirut today and we're joined by Omar Christidis, founder of ArabNet, as you all know, is the region's premier conference on Arab web and mobile industry, which kicks off next week here in Beirut. Um, hi, Omar. Nice of you to uh, take some time off your very busy schedule uh, to join us and uh, do this webinar. Of course, we're going to be talking about uh, building communities by creating participatory, participatory platforms and frameworks for shared experiences using social media. And uh, later on in the webinar, uh, during the last half hour, we're going to take your questions about community building live on the WAMDA Ustream channel. So let's just start. Uh, why building community? Why did you cho uh, choose this subject matter, first of all? Um, well, I think that uh, there's not a lot of opportunities for Arabs uh, often to engage in civic organizations, to build, uh, to uh, uh, organize in communities of shared interests. Uh, and uh, one of the important things that I've done in my career is actually work on a couple of such communities. Uh, one of them was the Yale Arab Alumni Association, uh, which we built a community of over 200 uh, Arab alumni of Yale with a vision towards promoting civic engagement and development in the region. Um, and uh, ArabNet is another one where I saw the need for a community rallying around uh, the web, mobile, and entrepreneurship and giving opportunity for young people who have ideas and startups uh, to get those out there. So. Uh, that's, that was kind of the driving force. Okay, and um, what is the most single important factor for generating a community that actually sticks and uh, continues to grow? Um, I think there are a lot of um, a lot of things that help communities grow. And actually, we could we could talk about it a lot. I could show you some of the slides. Okay. You want yeah. me to do that? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Now? Go ahead. Sure. So. Um, First off, I would start off with a kind of a bit of a philosophical definition of, uh, of community. So I was saying, um, starting off with a philosophical definition of community. Actually, I studied uh, political philosophy in university, and one of my favorite uh, authors was a guy named Carl Deutsch. And he said, community is developed by social learning through shared memories, symbols, and habits. It consists of people who have learned to communicate with each other more effectively and over a wider range of subjects than with outsiders. Mm -hmm. Then he says, insofar as a common culture facilitates communication, it forms a community. So um, the, the question here is, if we want to create a community, how do we create these things that we just talked about? Uh, symbols, memories, shared experiences. Those are the things that facilitate communication between groups of people and allow them to have a shared identity and a shared community. Okay. So, uh, what I'm interested in actually talking about are a couple of examples that, that I've seen uh, in the Arab world of people who have effectively created local and regional communities. Um, and these are some of the examples that we'll look at. I'm Mantech Tuesdays, GeekFest, Creative Commons, WAMDA, uh, and from my own experience, the Yale Arab Alumni Association and ArabNet. So, uh, one of the first things that, uh, that I talk about is participatory platforms, right? We talk mm -hmm. about this in the promo, we talk about this, and it's maybe sure. a, 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 a opaque word. So the first, the first thing is participatory platforms. And the concept of a participatory platform is the idea that um, there are individuals uh, who are active in their own uh, social networks. And bringing these individuals together uh, into a platform, giving them a role that makes them a stakeholder in this new community, right? So. Um, there's a couple of examples here that I would talk about. Uh, one of them is, is GeekFest, and the other one is um, Amman Tech Tuesdays. And I'm just gonna show these slides briefly and then talk to you guys. And the concept here is, you'll see from those slides, uh, there are a bunch of people, um, individuals, who are actually quite active in their communities, quite active in their own social networks, who are taking the stage, speaking, and drawing their networks into this new community. Whether it's, uh, it's Razan Khatib or Ahmed Dahmash uh, in, in Amman Tech Tuesdays, or it's uh, uh, Samir Karam and uh, Maya Zankul in Lebanon. Um, these are people who are able to uh, bring in their networks into this new community that's formed. Um, ArabNet did, does a similar thing, actually, in, in different ways. Um, we bring our biggest fans into our, uh, make them stakeholders. One, by making them ambassadors. This is one of the first things that we did. 
Uh, last year we had over 40 ambassadors from around the region, each of whom was really excited. They felt like they belonged and they were proponents and evangelists for us in different communities. Um, another one was official bloggers. Uh, so we had over 12 official bloggers last year and we're, we're doing all these th same things again this year to keep our community engaged. Um, and, uh, but it could be something simpler than that. Like when we kicked off uh, ArabNet this year, we had a, uh, a competition for a tagline, right? Um, and actually these taglines were printed on our banners that we took around with us on the road trip. And what we did is we brought in our community, we told them, come in and tell us, give us your best ideas for taglines. So we collected uh, over 50 taglines and then they voted on these taglines again and uh, they chose the best taglines. So this is about taking people who are really excited about you and making them members of uh, your stakeholders in your organization. Uh, we talked about the concept of a participatory platform. Uh, the next thing that I want to talk about are frameworks for shared experience. Another maybe complicated kind of buzzy sounding word. And what a framework for shared experience is for me is a kind of a formula for putting together uh, an event or a, a happening that can be repeated across different places. So uh, the elements are common in each place for each uh, set of people who are experiencing them. And this shared experience brings people together. So it's a framework for shared experiences. And I'll look at a couple of examples here. Uh, so the first example we can look at is GeekFest. GeekFest has taken place in many different cities across the region. We've had GeekFest Cairo, we've had GeekFest Dubai, we've had GeekFest Beirut. And two things that I want to show on this slide. On the far right hand side, you see a text. Those are guidelines for how to put on a GeekFest. Uh, and they give you kind of a, a prescription for a set of rules for putting on this event in different places. What I want to show on the left-hand side is the similarity of uh, symbol sim symbolism. Mm -hmm. um, the kind of green that's repeated in each of these uh, posters. Uh, this shared symbols again becomes part of this identity, this shared experience around this concept. Um, uh, same thing we see in the Creative Commons salons. Uh, with the Creative Commons salons are events also that happen all around the world. And uh, you can see from the slide here on the left hand side are again rules for putting together a Creative Commons Salon, which make sure that there's similar experiences in each event. And on the right hand side, you'll see the consistency of the imagery from Berlin to Beirut to Amman, uh, symbols that are shared and that can be communicated about. Um, this is something that we also try to do in Arabnet uh, with, with the roadshow. Uh, and the Rocho actually was something that we did in December. We, uh, we wanted to find the best entrepreneurs across the region. And to do that, we felt like we needed to actually go to them. So, we're talking about the Rocho. Um, we wanted to connect with entrepreneurs across the region. And we felt the best way to do that was actually to hop on a bus and to travel from city to city uh, and do workshops to, to talk to these people in their own communities. And this was another opportunity for us, again, to leverage some of the, these things that we've been talking about. So. Uh, one, we talked about a, uh, a framework for shared experience. Here's, uh, no, where it is? Here's our framework for shared experience. We had a, a framework for each of these workshops. We did a workshop in each city, and in each city we brought together a consultant, a lawyer, an investor, an entrepreneur, and a professional. And from here you can see uh, this common experience of having all these people talk uh, the same structure, the same, we even covered the same case in each city. So we covered a case of someone trying to understand how to put together a used book sales website, right? Um, the same structure replicated gives a similar experience that helps build a community around the concept of Arabnet. Similarly, what we've been talking about the shared symbols, right? So the bus here is a great shared symbol, right? This bus that traveled with us in every country that we went to. Here you can see the bus in front of Burj Khalifa, the bus in Hamra, um, and uh, this bus, everyone who participated in an ArabNet uh, workshop uh, and who saw this bus uh, feels connected to people who saw the bus in other right. cities, right? Um, the last thing that we did is actually we had this similar branding behind us, a kind of a backdrop that traveled with us from city to city. Again, this is, uh, you can see, this is the kind of, of graphic imagery that we had in everywhere that we went. And this shared image helped build um, connectivity between the, the members that are attending the workshop in each city. Okay. So, uh, the third thing that we want to talk about is shared content and communication channels. Um, and uh, one great example actually related to WAMDA and the celebration of entrepreneurship 
is the adventures of the mini entrepreneur, right? Al entrepreneur al saghir. And uh, when I went to the celebration of entrepreneurship, uh, I, uh, I had already seen a whole bunch of episodes of the mini entrepreneur. Um, so we were talking about the, the mini entrepreneur. Uh, when I ar arrived at the Celebration of Entrepreneurship, I had already seen a whole bunch of episodes of the Mini Entrepreneur. They're funny, they were engaging, they were interesting. I knew the character, right? When I showed up there, they were showing it on the screens in the conference. They had a whole bunch of people who were... All, so many of the people who were attending the event had already seen the Mini Entrepreneur. And this was something that people... Remember our initial quote, these shared symbols, symbols that create um, communication, that enable communication between people, right? So I could then meet someone at, at, uh, at the Celebration of Entrepreneurship and say, oh, did you see this, uh, this mini entrepreneur episode? Mm -hmm. Oh, that was great. I love the mini entrepreneur. Already there's an affinity here that was built even before coming to the event through this uh, shared content. Oh. So this is something else that actually we've done at the Yale Arab Alumni Association. We have a, a newsletter. A newsletter is a great way to build shared content. Uh, we have one at the Yale Arab Alumni Association, and we have a digest here uh, at, uh, the a at ArabNet. And the ArabNet digest is actually both a shared communication channel and a participatory platform, because what we've done with the ArabNet digest is we've asked members of the community, might be difficult for you guys to see, but these are actually members of the community who are recommending articles for us every week, right? So we, we take their recommendations and we compile them into this newsletter uh, that goes back out to the community. Right? So these people are uh, stakeholders in this newsletter. They spread the word to their friends. They spread the word to their, to their networks. And uh, it's something that everyone shares. So people can say, oh, did you read the most recent article in the ArabNet Digest? Or did you read the most recent article in the uh, Yale Arab Alumni newsletter? So uh, this can, can really help build that kind of uh, uh, shared sentiment. The last thing that I really want to talk about is what I call regularity and individual relationships. And I pull up this last slide here, which is you know, a lot of happy, smiling faces. Mm -hmm. So uh, the last thing that, we, uh, that I wanted to talk about is regularity and individual relationships. And we saw the slide of uh, these people who are all smiling. Um, and why are they all smiling? It's because they're all friends with each other. Actually, they know each other. And uh, uh, a lot of them actually have met each other at the previous event. So having this kind of regularity with opportunities for people to build one-on-one -on -one relationships, these one-on-one -on -one relationships underpin the community, right? These are the, the, the building blocks that build this larger uh, community. So it's very important to have regular engagement, whether it's through a physical event or through an online engagement. So, and that kind of summarizes the, my toolkit for building communities. Okay. Um, it's a, definitely a work in progress and uh, love to get people's feedback on what other tools they think are, uh, are really helpful in, in getting people ex uh, engaged with each other in a community. Um, okay, and um, so what about how important is it to, is it to bring the uh, online communities offline or vice versa? Uh, do you think uh, having a community bridge the online offline uh, divide makes it more coherent or more enduring? Definitely. I think that it's very important for people to, to connect with each other in, uh, in a physical space. Um, I think that, actually this is why people do tweet ups. And so uh, I've been to so many tweet ups where I show up and <clears throat> there are these people who I've been following on Twitter and talking with and engaging with and I'm seeing them for the first time. For sure I feel like I already know them, but I put a picture to the, I put a face to the picture and I understand more where they're coming from. I get a, a more three-dimensional version of, of, of the relationship becomes three-dimensional. Three so um, I, I think that uh, it's very important to have this uh, personal interaction. Okay. And um, do you think it's, uh, uh, it's best to start by building from hyper-local communities and then expanding regionally? Or should one begin with the concept of a regional community and then push down to find uh, local advocates? Mm, interesting question. Uh, you know, it's not about local or not local. It's about shared interest. So it's about finding people that are excited about the same thing and then providing them with opportunities to get together around that shared interest mm -hmm. and providing them content around that shared interest, providing them uh, experiences and symbols. And, and uh, so 
I think that, I mean, definitely ArabNet started actually pretty regionally at first. Right. It never started locally. I mean, we were building it on both levels, for sure. Um, let's just continue, right? Yeah. We'll restart and then we'll continue. Exactly. Um, it started on, on both levels. When, we, when, we first, when I first started talking about ArabNet, mm -hmm. it was um, going to each city and meeting the people who I knew on Twitter, holding tweet ups. So I held a tweet up in Amman, I held a tweet up in Damascus meeting people I had never met before in a very local way, mm -hmm. but then bringing them all onto this virtual regional platform, which was a Twitter account, a Facebook page, where we were constantly engaging them in content. Content is really critical. Yeah. I mean, and I think that this, anyone who's done kind of community management realizes the importance of content, really value added content. Um, yeah, well, going back to ArabNet, um, with ArabNet uh, was uh, starting with the local Beirut ICT community a critical element of your success, would you say? Actually, uh, not really. No. No. Uh, it was not. I actually feel like I, I built a lot of relations. I had good relationships in Beirut, okay. but it was more critical to my success was, or our success, was going and building communities in different cities. Okay. Um, and so, but in each place we, we did build a local network and in each place we had partners who were our advocates and we had media partners and supporting partners and, uh, and uh, uh, sponsors who are also really our, our advocates and speakers. And so in each place we went to, we had, uh, we created a, like a cell of people who mm -hmm. were really excited about us and bringing people, pulling people in. Mm -hmm. And um, let's talk about the impact of having a community on the individual and on the society. How, I mean, uh, besides being able to exchange ideas and, you know, um, tools, etc., um, in the bigger picture, how does it impact a society? I love these questions. <laughs> uh, how does it impact a society? Well, I think that communities around shared interests, which is what we're talking about, uh, are communities that have shared vision and goals mm -hmm. and are able to, when they are able to organize, are able to collectively channel their efforts towards reaching those goals. So uh, ArabNet as a community helps promote the growth of the web in the mobile industry in the region. Mm -hmm. So we provide it with uh, exposure to people who never heard about it, our collective power, when we all get together, makes us uh, more visible, more powerful, um, and more focused, and we learn from each other, and we build relationships that can help everyone grow. So I think that all of those things are, are really important. Uh, the same thing with the Yale Arab Alumni Association, getting yeah. people who have shared values and shared vision. Um, we did a conference actually on urban sustainability. So we were able to bring in all of these stakeholders who were thinking about how to make Arab cities sustainable in the future. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, the, con the, con the idea of having a conference around this subject, which is rarely discussed in our region, um, already was raising awareness about something. Already was bringing stakeholders together. It was a very interdisciplinary conference. So stakeholders that may never have, uh, had nev may never have met each other without this event. So, and those relationships uh, help uh, achieve new goals. Okay. Um, you had mentioned in one of your previous presentations um, on the same subject that um, you know we, we build communities because we don't have a lot of uh, opportunities in the Arab world for civic engagements. Which I said again, yes. Yes, and um, so I wanted to ask you, in the Western world, there yes. are more opportunities yes. uh, for civic engagement. How, how, how are building communities different uh, in the West than they are in the Arab world? Are they, I mean, how do they differ in that sense? Uh, you know what's interesting to me? I can tell you a story about this, which is to say, I'm actually, a, a, I was at a singing group at Yale. Okay. And uh, I sang with the Wiffenpoofs, which is the oldest all-male acapella, collegiate acapella group in America. And... Uh, I can tell you that the Wiffenpoofs are now 95 years old, actually, uh, yeah, 95 years old, and when they have reunions, people who are 60 and 70 come mm -hmm. back for the reunion, and they get up on stage and they sing. And they're 70 years old. I've actually seen them go on stage with an oxygen tank. I've seen them go on stage <laughs> wow. on the, like, uh, the, the, I don't know what it's called, the or whatever. Um, but, the, the idea of belonging to an institution that is not-for-profit, 
not for, pers for personal gain, mm -hmm. um, but for, for fulfillment, for, uh, for making yourself a, um, a more holistic, developed person. This is something that I think is very strong, in, at least in the United States. And so I think this is, I would love to see more of that. You know, I would love to see our universities have more bands and more chess clubs and more, um, uh, I don't know, swimming teams. Because all of these things, actually what they do is they build team spirit. They build an ability to work with people that you may not necessarily like. I had, I had to sing and work with people that sometimes I didn't get along with, but I learned. It helps you build an understanding of how to work with a team of equals, not just in a hierarchical uh, mm -hmm. structure. And in a team of equals, uh, you have to compromise, you have to uh, be diplomatic. All of these skills that are taught to you by these civic institutions. I know this is not an answer to your question, but a, a kind of a riff on it, which is what I think we could use more of. Um, so I think that Americans more, are more naturally they have a natural affinity towards these groups mm -hmm. because they've been more uh, exposed to them. They've, they've uh, engaged in them more often and earlier in their lives. That's, that's true. And we're, we're catching on slowly but surely, I guess. Um, you feel the change in the Arab world. Yeah, as far for sure, as for sure. And I think that there's, like a, there's a cultural question here, which is I would like to see parents encourage their, ch their children to participate in ungainful activities that, that improve their, them as people. Yeah, ungainful, that's, uh, that's uh, the key word here. Ungainful yes. activities. And not just, I mean, necessarily, not even just helping the community, but, but just uh, personal development. Mm -hmm. Very true, very true. And hopefully uh, the new generations uh, are, are aware of that and are, uh, you know, will encourage the, their kids and the youth to do so. Um, okay, going back to... Uh, the roadshow that you've launched, um, which has been very successful. How critical was it uh, having a local presence, again, going back, uh, for scaling the Arab, uh, Arab Net uh, brand? It was extremely important. Okay. Um, so I can't actually explain to you, and this is like for scaling, and people talk about scaling the logistics of working in the Arab world versus working in the United States. Uh, the borders are a nightmare. Right, organizing for all these people, and we have different nationalities, and the women and men, and uh, getting clearances for everyone to go to all these countries, plus getting the bus to be able to go to these different countries, was a real challenge. And um, besides just the logistics of the borders and the legal issues, we had the logistics of finding a venue, uh, creating buzz in the local community, um, and all of these were challenges that would have been almost impossible without a local partner. So it, one of our biggest uh, tasks was making sure that we had a strong local partner in each community that we went to. And we found a lot of organizations that are really excited about web and mobile entrepreneurship. So, I mean, I can tell you like uh, Dubai Internet City in Dubai was extremely helpful. Okay. They were our, our champion on the ground. Sagia, Saudi Arabian General Investment Authority in Riyadh. And they had kicked off the uh, Saudi startup community, and actually the governor of, the, of Sagia, who's basically like a minister in the Saudi government, came and spoke at the opening to a lot of young entrepreneurs who were really excited about this. So you'll see that it's getting a lot of attention from governments. Um, same thing in, in, in Doha, we had the support of ICT Qatar, mm -hmm. um, and they're also launching an incubator program quite soon, and they're really uh, active in this. So uh, in Egypt, we had the AUC, um, Everywhere that we went, we, we had local partners. Okay. Um, let's talk about resources. Yes. Um, you need resources almost to do anything. Um, as far as building communities, a lot of people might say, well, we don't have the resources. Okay. Although that doesn't really, uh, in, in today's world, today's technological world, it, resources are available almost free of charge to build communities online, let's say, correct? Yes. So, um, what do you need in terms of resources to build a community? Yes, yes. Not just, I mean, you can build it online, but what about building it offline as well? If you don't have the right resources to uh, build it offline, is, think is online all, just enough? Yeah, yeah, all the examples actually that we, we've discussed today are all communities that have built, been built with zero resources. Mm -hmm. so Geek Fest, yeah. um, Aman Tech Tuesdays, all of these things are actually community organized. And the way that it works is when you engage a lot of people as stakeholders, the burden is shared in a yeah. very uh, in a in a in a way that makes things, enables this to, to happen in a much easier way, um, and so there's not a lot of resources required, but there is sharing, collaboration, 
um, uh, uh, open-mindedness and openness in general. Mm -hmm. So these are all things that, that you need to have in order to establish this kind of community. Okay. So would you say that uh, having the technology that we have today has been the biggest enabler in creating communities uh, worldwide, not just in the Arab world? Sort of, or not enabler, sort of really put things into fast uh, motion as far as creating communities as a tool? Well, so this is like the question of the long tail, yeah. right? And people talk about the long tail is um, monetizing. Uh, so there's a whole bunch of people who like a couple of things, mm -hmm. but there's a lot of little, a lot of uh, small groups of people who like a million things. That's a very bad explanation of the long tail. But essentially it means that there, if you are able to cater for a huge amount of interest, you're able to capture a very large market. What the internet does is it allows people who otherwise are small percentages of their communities uh, to connect from different communities and generate a critical mass. Mm -hmm. So the concept of a shared interest, like the Yale Arab Alumni Association is actually a perfect example of this. In every country we've got three, four, five, ten, fifteen people, not enough to have an office, not enough right. to have a local chapter. Sure not enough to have uh, enough momentum to have an organization that is independent in one location. Mm. However, it is enough when you combine it with individuals in each of these different cities um, and then uh, connect these people through uh, shared experiences, shared symbols, shared communication channels, shared uh, uh, events. So uh, definitely the internet has enabled these scattered mm -hmm. communities to connect more easily. We can talk about the content is different. Uh, we have more specific content this year. Last year the, the panels were quite broad. Mm. Uh, this year we're, we're honing in on more specific subjects. Like last year we had an e-commerce panel, this year we have a group buying panel, which is really relevant to what's going on right now and very specific. Okay. Um, we're having different formats. So last year was only panels, this year we have interviews and we have workshops that allow people to look at case studies and get more in depth in specific subjects. Uh, we've got more speakers, we've got more participants, uh, we've got uh, just a higher level of engagement. Uh, we've got a mobile app this year, okay. which is going to allow people actually to... Uh, it has some of the functionalities that the SpotMe device had at the Celebration of Entrepreneurship, um, which will be that people will be able to search for who's attending the event, send them business cards, send them messages to book meetings and things like this. Uh, we've got... Um, the ideas and the startups this year were amazing. We had uh, double the number of people who applied. Uh, and just even the, the, the quality of applicants was, was really top-notch and uh, it was, it was uh, really tough actually deciding on 10 finalists. Mm -hmm. We didn't even do it ourselves because we, we wanted to make sure it's as fair, as transparent as possible. So we had a couple of partners who worked with us on this process. Um, and, but the startups are going to be really awesome. A lot of them have a lot of traction, a lot of visitors, very investable in for our investors. They can get excited about that. Um, what else is going to be different? We're doing a lot of cool things with technology. Okay. So watch out for the use of QR codes, for the use of the Connect as a motion sensor technology to be able to do cool things. Okay. Uh, we also have, um, we're going to be doing cool Twitter visualizations. So like a stepping up from what we did last year. Uh, so yeah, a lot of cool, cool things in store. Excellent. Well, I'm just going to hit you with one last question. Uh, regarding um, young entrepreneurs like yourself and building communities. Yes. Um, wh what do you have to say to them? Um, you know, especially now, you know, it, it, it is a very difficult time uh, in the Arab world, a, a new time, a, a, a different time, let's just say. And... Um, transformative. Transformative is the word, exactly. And um, so what advice would you give uh, young entrepreneurs as yourself? Uh, in this transformative time. In this, tra <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, Especially mm -hmm. that we saw what you know what communities have done and how they've contributed to sort of transforming, you know, the situation yes. and that's, in the region. Yes, and that's actually amazing. We're gonna we're gonna have a panel on this at the conference yeah. this year, uh, and I'm gonna let them speak about that matter. Uh, um, for entrepreneurs in these times. For our little Wanda community of entrepreneurs. Um, yeah. I would say that understanding the tools at your disposal is more important than ever. Um, we've seen the way that people can spontaneously connect and 
create huge outcomes. Mm -hmm. um, we uh, at ArabNet do m almost all of our marketing through, uh, through partnerships and through community building. Um, and this is a true transformation. It used to be that you had to get a Super Bowl ad to get a lot of buzz out. Mm -hmm. This is a very different time today. Uh, if you are able to think about how to engage your community in a smart way, you can spread the word about your uh, startup very quickly. Um, and I would, the other thing I would say is that uh, there's a lot of opportunities that are created by these tumultuous times that we live in. Uh, actually, Khan O'Donnell, who is the CEO of Sarmadi in Egypt, who I think is, an, is awesome, uh, when we did our workshop in Cairo, he talked about building a corruption app which would be a crowdsourced way of people to say, if they had a dealing with a corrupt person, to rate them as corrupt, and then we would eventually have a um, rating for different people and their level of corruption. Now, this was actually before anything took place in Egypt. Right. Um, but the concept of building applications that are, uh, that leverage this to create more transparency, more democracy, more participation, there's a lot of opportunities in this space. I can talk about one, actually, I was a member of the Yale Entrepreneurial Institute, which is an incubator at Yale. And one of the, the startups that came out a couple of years after me is called C Click Fix. Okay. Um, and this fits in the theme of like social enterprise, which again, there'll be a panel on this at ArabNet, uh, on organizations that are using web and mobile to really leverage, uh, to really uh, increase their impact. And what C Click Fix does is it allows citizens to see a problem in their, in their community, like a broken street lamp, a pothole, mm. they take a picture, and because of the technology, the picture is tagged with the geolocation. Okay. The picture goes on this platform, and then members of the community can read through these issues and, uh, and vote up or down on these problems. Mm -hmm. So what you eventually have is crowdsourced uh, issues that need fixing in the local community, mm -hmm. so that the municipality, uh, within its abilities can see, oh, okay, there's a pothole in the street and everyone seems to be going into that pothole and mm -hmm. ruining their cars. Mm -hmm. This is the number one priority for us to fix. There are lots of opportunities for us to engage in these kinds of applications as well. All right, guys, uh, some of your questions just uh, came in. Again, we really apologize for um, the stream uh, today. Um, so, here's a question for you, Omar. Don't you think social media is now overrated, especially after the recent uh, political upheavals? I, I don't think that social media is overrated. I was actually just writing about this yesterday. Uh, there are now over 600 million people on Facebook. There are 140, uh, 140 million tweets per week. Uh, these, these, uh, this media is redefining that people communicate and consume content mm -hmm. and make decisions about products. And uh, this is not a small change that we're seeing. Uh, sure, they've, they've gotten a lot of hype in terms of what it can do for citizenship. But in terms of my own experience, so much of the media that I consume today is filtered through my social networks. And uh, they're the first people that I go to if I want to ask a question. Um, so beyond Facebook and Twitter, things like Quora and Artvark which are our first place where you go, you post a question, able to get an answer from, from the mm -hmm. community. Um, so I, I definitely don't think that social media is overrated and I, I do think that it is going to be more integrated into everything that we do um, uh, going forward. Okay, um, would you say, um, who's benefiting more, small businesses or big businesses as far as building communities uh, online from Facebook and Twitter and these tools? I think it's actually small businesses will benefit more from these things because large businesses have inertia. They are, it's more difficult for them to figure out how to, uh, to fit new media into their organization. Uh, social media is not something that it's just like another thing that you can add to it. So I love to call it like when people go to these agencies and they say, well, you just sprinkle a little social media dust on, on my <laughs> you know, brand. <laughs> and. Uh, that's, that's not the way it goes. Actually, uh, I like uh, a couple of people who've said this, which is Mazen Nahawi from a news group at a conference that I was at. He said, and, and I think the online project believes this also, which is that social media needs to be integrated into the DNA of the organization, into the organizational structure, mm -hmm. right? Uh, you have to be responsive to people. You have to listen to them. You have to understand how to channel their concerns into your customer service. You have to understand how to take your promotions and, and, and move them online. You have to 
it's not something that is just someone sitting in a back office and, mm -hmm. and generating things. Or something that you can outsource to your agency, even worse, because they don't have the expertise. What you need to be doing is building expertise and building relationship with your consumers. This is your opportunity to, to engage them, not uh, to just have a, another push, uh, a method to push your messages. Uh, so small businesses can definitely benefit, plus small businesses don't have the same resources. And social media is essentially free. Mm -hmm. so, but very time consuming. Time consuming, yes. But you know, it's also, uh, there's, a, there's a multiplier effect. Right? As a small business, I remember when Aardvark launched. It's another good business. I don't know if, if, if everyone doesn't know what it, it's a Q&A business. Mm -hmm. Q&A service that was launched off of like a chat sites. And it routes your question to a person who knows the right answer. <laughs> right? And uh, they were acquired by, by Google for $50 million. Awesome. Um, but they started off, when they started off, I was actually one of the first uh, invitees and I was really excited about using this service and I use it a lot. And I received a me an email, like maybe a couple of months into the service saying, you are one of the 50 uh, most, uh, you know, you're the, one of the 50 people who use this service most. They called me an Ardvocate, Ardvark Ardvocate. Great. They sent me a t-shirt. They put me on this like small email list where they were sending me updates, they were asking my opinion for things. All of a sudden, I was, I was telling everyone about this. I was so excited. I was wearing my t-shirt and going out and talking to people. And, and uh, free advertising, free marketing for these people. Uh, so I think definitely this is, some, this is an example of ways that people can do things, not themselves, but to engage people and make them stakeholders, like we said. Correct. Well, another inter this questions are finally starting to come in. Um, one uh, viewer asks, what is the biggest social media challenge in Lebanon besides the internet? <laughs> what is the biggest social media challenge in Lebanon? Um, I don't know that the social media is, is particularly local. So I don't know that we could say what's the, the challenge of social media in, in Lebanon per se. Um, okay. Right, so what's... Besides the internet. You know, yeah. Besides being able to uh, to log on and uh, and use it, um, another question: How did Twitter help in spreading the word about ArabNet? Twitter was very important with helping spread the word about ArabNet. A couple of ways. One, uh, Twitter allowed us to be. Twitter is a it's a form of of media. It's not just a social network. And so when we talk about uh, about Twitter. We're talking about people who are consuming content and following people they're interested in. And actually, we are much more present on Twitter than we are on Facebook because, um, because we are constantly engaging people who are excited about technology, who are finding us through other people who are retweeting us, who are finding us through people who are uh, talking about us. So that's one way. And the other way is, is when we had tweet ups and going into these individual cities, finding people who we had connected with virtually and connecting with them personally and building those one-on-one -on -one relationships that are the underlying assets of a, of a relationship, of a community. Okay. So, uh, yeah, a couple of questions about Twitter. Now a question about fa uh, Facebook. Somebody's asking how to use Facebook to build better communities in the Arab world. Um, well, again, I think this goes back to Facebook as a tool. Um, and the, the idea here is that uh, what, what people can do is they have to have the initiative to create communities and maintain communities around common interests and goals, mm -hmm. right? So if they want to create a better, uh, you know, great, idea, great one uh, example. In Lebanon, people were really frustrated at the fact that there are all of these, that smoking is allowed in all of these uh, restaurants and pubs and things like this. And so people formed a Facebook group saying, let's, you know, all band together around this common uh, goal, which is to get to pressure these uh, these establishments or to, to convince these establishments that they should at least create places where there are no smoking or to go to no smoking altogether. So in creating a community of shared interest towards a common goal, these people have empowered themselves in their, their cause, right? All of a sudden they could coordinate. Um, same thing actually with in Lebanon most recently, uh, the laic pride, or basically mm. secular uh, movement for secularism in, in Lebanon. And again, a movement that started mostly on, on Facebook, brought together all these people, and they went out and marched for this cause, and, and started getting, making people aware that, okay, you're not the only one who believes in this, or who's excited about this, or who's 
angry about this. No, we're, we're all together. Let's talk about how we can make it, make it better. Yeah. Well, you'll be happy to know that one, uh, one viewer actually heard about ArabNet, not through social media, through the radio, I think she says here. <laughs> so, uh, still, old-fashioned tools are still uh, also uh, working in uh, spreading the word. No, no, of course. And <clears throat> you have to use as many, as many tools as, as possible. But even our radio, uh, you know, our radio uh, ads, they actually come through partnerships. Mm. So we work a lot with partners. We are a platform. We try to plug in people. We try to engage people in as much as possible. This is what is this, the success of Arabnet is about bringing these people together and giving them a piece each. Okay. Well, Ahmed, um, we look forward to Arabnet uh, next you. week. I'm sure it's going to be a huge success. Thanks. We look forward to having you. You're going to be in the, we're, we're Wanda gonna, in the yes, interview corner. Absolutely. We're going to be there and, uh, uh, and we look forward to hearing, you know, um, all the new ideas uh, that are going to be uh, presented. And uh, thanks so much for being with us today. My pleasure. Uh, I really, again, I apologize for the state of the internet. It's outside of my control. Uh, I'm sure our viewers know that, and I'm sure they know that... Um, Everybody, keep your fingers crossed. <laughs> We're trying to get 30, if, 20, 20, if not 30 megabits per second for the conference, which will be like five times the amount of internet that we had last year, which will be hopefully will allow people to at least, you know, tweet and check emails and do things like this. So. Absolutely. Amar, thanks again. Thank you very much. Thanks Good for, luck. Thanks for coming and having me. Thanks.